Today, we dive into everything you need to know about food writing. From blogs and cookbooks to recipes and reviews, there's a whole world of food writing out there. Next on Bacon Bacon. Hey there, I'm Jason Logson, and this is Bacon Bacon. We're all about helping you serve your fans, grow your income, and get the most out of your blog. Today's episode is brought to you by my very own self-publishing 101 course. The average home cook owns almost 50 times more printed cookbooks than PDF cookbooks. So why are you limiting yourself? With the advent of print-on-demand companies like Amazon KDP and Ingram Spark, it's now easier than ever to become your own publisher. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can waste not only your time, but also your money. That's where my video course comes in, stepping you through the entire self-publishing process so you can get your printed cookbook up for sale on Amazon. You can check it out at makethatbacon.com slash publish now. Now, on to the show. As bloggers, we often try to improve our photography skills, get better at SEO, and learn how social media really works. But we often forget to spend the time working on our writing skills. And as the backbone of what we do, honing those skills can be crucial to moving your blog forward. Luckily, today's guest is the perfect person to help us out. She is a multiple award-winning writer and author. Her book, Will Write for Food, is in its fourth edition and has won three international awards. She has co-authored two cookbooks, Grilled Pizzas and Piadinas, and The United States of Pizza. Her essay, The Meaning of Mangoes, won an annual award from the Association of Food Journalists. She was previously a newspaper, magazine, and publishing company editor. She coaches on getting published, whether with a book, article, or blog. Her blog is aimed at food writers at dianej.com slash b. And I can't wait to learn from today's guest, Diane Jacob, author of Will Write for Food. Diane, welcome to Making Bacon. Thank you so much, Jason. That was a great introduction. I'm really excited to have you on and talk about all things food. You're such an expert on the subject. Before we get started, I always like to ask, what's it like around your dinner table on a typical day? Huh. <laughs> you know, I... Boy, that's that's a good question. It's it's pretty varied, I hope. There's a lot of CalMed, CalLatel. I mean, everything starts from, for me, visiting the farmer's market and making something based on that. So there's a lot of stir fries and salads and soups and a lot of Asian cooking, a lot of Middle Eastern cooking. I guess those are my two favorites. Is there anything that when you go to the farmer's market, they don't usually have, but when you see it, you just get really excited because it's that time of year that it's it's available? Oh, well, cherry season has just started. And so the first kind of cherry, which here in California is a Brooks cherry, was out there gleaming and beautiful and red. And, and they were good, which was a nice surprise. Yeah, I feel like sometimes early in the season, you can get really excited because it's finally showing up, but it's not quite at the peak yet. So I'm glad they, they had right. uh, the perfect ripeness for you. <laughs> yeah, they were good. So we'll write oh, for also, food. Also, Aprium. Okay. Do, you, do you know what Apriums are? No, I do not. They're a cross between an apricot and a plum, and they're, they're apricot forward as opposed to pluots, which are a cross between a pluot and an apricot, but are plum forward. I feel like the okay. flavor of apricots is a lot better. So that sounds very interesting. They're both fantastic. But yeah, I got some apriums, which are really good too. And is it, is it that time of year right now that they're finally coming out? Yeah. Yeah. Just started. I have it on my list now that things are opening up a bit here in New York to finally make it back out to the Fort Greene Farmer's Market and the Grand Army Plaza Farmer's Market. So I'll have to keep my eyes open for those. Great. Yeah. Oh, some peaches. We have peaches, too. I am jealous. We are, we are definitely behind <laughs> you out here. I'm sorry so, about that. <laughs> that's all right. We'll, we'll catch up eventually. <laughs> So Will Write for Food is about to enter its fourth edition. You know, I have my, I believe this is the second edition that I have. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> I still remember being on vacation and reading, reading it while I was just getting started as a food writer and trying to decide, did I want to be a blogger? Did I want to do cookbooks? What did I want to do? And I, I can only imagine, like, you started working on the 16 years ago. What has it been like working on the same, like the same version or the same book <laughs> for 16 years? It sounds terrible when you say it that way. <laughs> but actually, it isn't because there's so much change. You know, like for the first edition, 
That was in 2005. Blogging had just started, and and I was I, I came from print journalism, so I I felt very snobby about blogs, and I thought, oh, I, you know, I don't really know what this is. Anyone can do anything they want. There's no gatekeepers. I'm an editor. You know, what's the quality? Blah blah. So I just ignored it, and then. But then we got to 2010. Wow, blogging was this huge thing, and there were big blogging stars, and they were starting to get book deals. And then I had to write, you know, 7,000 words on how to start a blog. Uh, so, you know, it changes over time. And then the 2015 edition, blogging has become more professionalized than when it first started. When it first started, it was more like a diary, a form of self-expression. There was no photography. Um, no one worried about search engine optimization. <laughs> and so then I got to dive into, well, how do you make money at this thing? And and how has it evolved? And what are all the new things you need to know now? And also, you know, cookbooks, what, what people want for cookbooks changes over time. Freelance writing. One thing that changed a lot was restaurant reviewing. Because when I started out, I that's that's where I started was a restaurant reviewer. I, I actually was a, the editor of a restaurant magazine in Vancouver, Canada when I was 22. And so that was my first foray into food writing from from regular journalism. And that that's what everyone thought food writing was. They, they thought it was about going to find restaurants. And for the longest time, that is what it was about. But now, once Yelp burst onto the scene, all those jobs went away. And and there's only really a handful of people now who are doing restaurant reviews that have any power or that anyone pays attention to. And so that, that field has just kind of gone away. I mean, there, there are restaurant roundups. There are stories about new restaurants, but that's different from being a critic. So that chapter has gotten progressively smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> Did you have any memorable experiences as a restaurant critic that really stood out to you, either good or bad? I think my favorite thing was I, I was reviewing, I had won a contest and started reviewing restaurants for San Francisco Weekly. I thought that was a really bizarre way to find a new reviewer, but whatever, right? And my cousin told me that he and his wife would get the paper every week and they would read my review to each other because they enjoyed it. And it just, it made me realize that so much of writing is just about entertainment. And it's not really something that we think about a lot, but, you know, they probably were never going to go to the restaurant and it didn't really matter that much to them. They just wanted to have this, you know, this, this fant this be in this fantasy world where I went and they could live through the experience with me, you know, vicariously. I feel like we're seeing that so much right now as people put out like the tasty style videos and cooking food network shows and things like that, that a lot of the people consuming that content are probably never going to make the dishes they're looking at. The the 30 second overhead video, they're not going to make it, but they are entertained by it and they're they're consuming that type of content. It's really interesting how that divide has kind of changed. Exactly. But that started a long time ago with cooking shows on on PBS, you know, my, my father-in-law never cooked anything. I think he, he made he made fried egg sandwiches. That was like the limit. And he he would spend all Saturday morning watching, you know, Jacques Pepin, Martin Yan, Julia Child. And he never had any intention of going any further than his, his armchair. It is interesting <laughs> just how much entertainment really plays into a lot of these fields. And making sure that you're entertaining the consumer and the reader will get you a long way, probably more so in some cases than having the best recipe for a chicken Caesar salad or something. Oh, totally. Because everyone thinks their recipe is the best recipe for chicken Caesar, right? So after a while, you just become immune to that as a reader about the best and yeah, my wife's best. As long yeah. as my wife thinks mine's the her fa her favorite version, that's all I really care about. <laughs> oh, that's that's sweet, really. Yeah, that is what counts. Yeah, <laughs> she's the boss, so. <laughs> I see. 
<laughs> you really had to dive into understanding blogging a little bit more and then how people make money as a blogger. How has that changed? Or have you seen interesting ways that people make money as a blogger that a lot of bloggers might not take advantage of? Well, to me, the big shift in blogging has been that the people who are super successful at it and have six figure incomes are they're business people. They are, they are entrepreneurs first. And, you know, yes, maybe they make all their money from posting recipes, but they really understand how to run a business. They understand how to hire people. There, there might be someone who takes the pictures. There might be someone who develops the recipe. There might be somebody who runs their Pinterest feed and someone who uploads all the content. I'm working with someone right now who got a book deal where 80% of her recipes could come from her blog. So I suggested she, you know, pay someone to create a file of once she identifies the recipes, she can just pay someone to get it all into one word document and then it will start looking like a book. You know, so they're not afraid to spend money. They're not afraid to invite other people in to work with them. And they're also very technical because, you know, because of the internet, everything online requires technical expertise now. And so the ones who've been the most successful are the people who are not afraid to jump in. I do feel like there's that big divide between bloggers that started their blog as a hobby and are now trying to monetize it versus people that started it as a business. And I think it's a hard mindset shift for a lot of, of hobbyists to try to turn it into a business. And I yeah. always say there's nothing wrong with running your blog as a, as a hobby. I have a lot of hobbies that, you know, no one's going to ever pay me to watch me play volleyball or do improv. But if you decide to make a living at it, you have to have that mindset shift of how can I treat this as a business? How can I invest in it? Like you're saying to free up your time to do the things that only you can provide value at. Right. And for, you know, if somebody comes from a writing background, they know how to be a writer. They don't necessarily know how to be a, you know, a business person or an entrepreneur. And, or they, if they just think that it would be fun and they don't care about getting paid. I mean, that's an argument I've had with writers forever is all the writers who don't mind um, writing for free because they like to. And that's definitely not a business mindset. <laughs> yes. It's hard. It's hard to do much for free and get, uh, make a living off of it. <laughs> no. Well, it, the thing is with food writing that historically people were not trying to make a living because either you were writing for free or you were being paid almost nothing. And so it really was a hobby for a lot of people. And there's actually very few writers who can make a living full-time. There are bloggers who can make a living full-time, but not writers. It's much harder for writers because the pay is so bad. I was talking about that your blog is really a marketing engine and that's the easiest way to make money from it is to use it to market a, a cookbook or a service or a line of products to sell something else where it can be very hard to make money just from writing on a blog and relying on like ad revenue or something like that, that using it as a marketing engine is a lot easier than just as a writer. Yes. And, and I mean, I haven't made that much money from my book, but, or, or my blog, which has been going since 2009, if, if you, but for me, it's not necessarily about the money. It's about what doors have opened as a result and what opportunities I've had also that lead to bigger so things. Just, yeah, it opens up a lot of doors, which is really interesting, both writing, cookbooks. We were talking a lot about what's changed over the years. What skills have you found that have stayed solid, that investing in improving these skills is always gonna help you in the long term? Well, because I, I guess because I have a journalism background, I feel like the, the skills that I learned in journalism have served me throughout my entire career as a writer, as an editor, as a reporter. And, you know, I've learned, you know, what's a good headline? What's a good title? What's a good lead? What's, how should things be structured? How do you interview someone? How do you do research? And so just, I guess, just from a writing standpoint, I really, I, it serves me every day. And I, I feel really grateful that I 
I did get a journalism. I actually ended up going to journalism school twice, once in Canada and once in the United States. And so I, I feel like that background has really served me. And I mean, even if I was, you know, I suppose if I was to start a podcast, I would have to do a deep dive into all the, the technical parts of it. But I did, I do know how to interview people. So, so that part is there. I, none of the tech stuff is there. That's where all the investing comes in from my standpoint. I feel like that's constantly changing as well. As soon as you figure out the tech side, something new comes out and you kind of have to tweak what you're doing anyway to figure it out again. <laughs> yes. And I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm married to a very technical person. And one of the things that I is different between the two of us is if, you know, if he is presented with a technical thing to figure out, he will get really excited and rush towards it and have a whole lot of fun figuring out how it works and, and get all excited. And I'll be like, mm, I don't know. I have to think about it. This is kind of scary. I don't know. I, what if I can't figure it out? And so I, I know that's pathetic and I try to, I work on it. I really do. But, but that's very different. It's a very different approach. And we have Those. to get, we have to, I have to recover from that attitude because just about everything we have to learn these days is technical. <laughs> so much more is shifting online and on computers and on our phones. Like it is, everything is technical these days, it feels like. <laughs> yeah, it's all going that way. So resistance is futile. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty good at most of the tech stuff, but I still get hung up on some things. And then I just have my wife figure it out for me. She's, she's better at that than I am anyway. <laughs> wow. Okay. I think she has more patience than me. I can figure stuff out quick. And if that doesn't happen, then it's like, Jody, will you come here and do this for me? <laughs> me too. Me too. I'm willing to give up much faster. My husband seems endlessly patient and he, he's going to just wrestle it to the ground and figure it out. And I, I'm so I'm so happy that we're married to each other because he's been very useful. I do have 24/7 tech support. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I do feel like that's almost like a skill is knowing what to give up on quickly and what to not give up on and really be tenacious about in the long term. Yes. So as more and more people go into food writing from blogs to social media, how can someone stand out in this crowd? What should bloggers be doing to have people notice them and not everyone else that's doing similar things? Well, that is a really good question because a lot of people are doing similar things. I mean, there's a, you know, there, there are a million blogs that are offering American comfort food. And so if you're going to have a meatloaf recipe, probably your recipe is not going to be that different from other people's recipes. So, how do you stand out? And I get a, I got a, get a lot of blowback about the idea of telling personal stories. That has been derided for, for bloggers as a bad thing to do and not rewarded in SEO. So if you can't do that, then what's left is having a strong voice. And that means letting your personality come through in your writing so that people know that this is your blog, your recipe and your blog versus any of the 2 billion other blogs that are offering the same kind of food. How can a writer go about developing a strong voice? What can, what can they focus on to improve that skill? Well, you know, it a strong voice is, is your personality. That's, and that's what you have to let out. So sometimes I get really caught up in being serious and being taken seriously and it it totally flattens up my writing and makes it a lot less interesting so so one one really good way is to just allow your personality to come through on the page and that means i mean you might use you might use certain expressions i just got an email from someone who said holy moly and uh, i you know i haven't heard that for a long time and it was kind of cute i think well, one way to work on it is how would you describe your voice? Like, are you, are you wry? Are you sarcastic? Are you 
super inquisitive? Do you are there a lot of puns and groaners? You know, who who is that person? And a lot of people have trouble finding the answer to that. So I always suggest that they ask their friends for some adjectives if you can't think of any because you I mean you are a particular way. So you you have to be more of you. It's like you on a lot of caffeine. <laughs> Take what makes you you and then push it out there a little bit, a little more forcefully. Push it. Yeah. Like when you like when you go to a party and you're all nervous and you sort of need to impress someone. That is what you have to turn on. And somehow that you you turn that on in your writing. And yeah. Well, I think what I learned from my cousin and his wife who read my reviews to each other is that I had to figure out how to how to entertain them while providing good information. But but I I could be really funny in those reviews and they liked that and kind of cutting. So that was what appealed to them. That was probably half of why they were even bothered reading it. It was about voice. I like that of knowing what your audience is looking for and you know you don't want to provide a voice that's completely different than what's comfortable for you but kind of tailoring your voice for the specific audience and if you're writing for like professional bakers you might need a more serious voice than if you're writing for you know single stay-at-home parents that are just trying to get meals on you know and handle a kid running around like you might want to communicate differently right and you do need to know your audience but you know since most most food writers are recipe writers. We kind of all get lumped into the same, being the same kind of person. You know, you want to be helpful. You want to be like, you know, the friend in the kitchen who's explaining everything. And you want to be techy, but not too much. And you, you want to don't, you want to not err on the side of too much instruction. And so that's just, one layer of you as a recipe writer, but the other layer is is your voice. Like, for example, Deborah Madison is a is a lyrical recipe writer, but most bloggers are not lyrical, and that's fine. You don't have to be lyr lyrical, but you need to be something that is identifiable to your reader, where your reader wants to come back for to hear to read what what you have to say, not just because you're going to have delicious content. That was one thing I really focused on being in the modernist cooking and the sous vide niche. Both of those were very technical based. A lot were written by food scientists and, you know, two or three star Michelin chefs. And so it was very kind of dense and presented, you know, here is what you need to know. And it's, it was very dense content. And I, I'm much more conversational. I've you know done a blog post for you. You've read my unedited, you know, semi unedited work. So like I'm very conversational and try to be like relatable to people. And I was lucky mm -hmm. enough to be in a niche that that was very different and had me stand out from the other people in it. Right. That, well, that is another way to stand out is that you chose a niche. And pe a lot of people are afraid to, to choose a niche because they don't want to be boxed in. And I have to say, I've been boxed in as someone who's interested in food writing for since 2004, a uh, really long time. But I don't mind because it's this niche is is narrow, but deep, very deep. So I can write about food, food writing and identity food writing and business, magazine writing, recipe writing, historical writing. I mean, there are, there are a million topics, burnout, confident, you know, why to go to a conference. Hopefully we can go to some again soon, but there are millions of topics. And so I don't, I don't get bored, even though it's, it's a narrow niche. And so I think one of the, things that make it hard for people is that they they think oh I love food and then they don't want to limit whatever food is to anything and then they're lumped in with a million other people who don't want to limit themselves to anything in particular and it's hard to tell one person from another but you know there aren't that many people in the sous vide space and if you got in early and made a name for yourself and 
and attracted a whole new audience that wasn't, you know, super guy, geeky kind of person who was attracted by the technology, then you have an opportunity to become known just for, for being you on top of whatever helpful information you're providing. I feel like the less of a niche you have too, like the only people that can really compete in those larger kind of topics are generally people with really well-known names. So if you don't narrow down, you're competing against the biggest names that are out there, the people with Food Network shows and, you know, they might, they still have niches and definitely strong voices, but they could write about a lot more stuff than someone that's a blogger just trying to get people to come to their site. So having that niche, I think is critical for directing your, not only your writing, but also making sure that there's people looking for that type of specific thing that you, you're not running into a Bobby Flay or a, you know, Garden and, you know, a Martha Stewart that you're, you know, now why would they choose you over someone like that if they don't know you already? Exactly. I do talk to people like that a lot with cookbooks because people who want to write a cookbook about everything or entertaining, you know, that's, they're competing with Ina Garten and the Magnolia cookbook. I don't know that one as well, but she's like the new younger version. Jo Joanna Gaines, is that her name? Do you know who I mean? I know who you mean, but I can't think of her name off the top. Yeah. So, you know, they've got 10 billion viewers and you don't, and they're, someone's going to choose them. And when they got started, they weren't writing about everything either. Most likely they probably got started and then kept working their way up. Yeah. Longer. They've been at it longer. Yeah, definitely. So if someone's interested in writing a cookbook, what do you think a good like first step is for them to start moving along this path to go from either a blogger or a food writer to someone that can have a cookbook out there? Well, I guess the question I would ask is, do you have a topic that would make a good cookbook? And, you know, what I've noticed is that this whole idea that you have to do a what used to be called a soup to nuts menu, you know, starting with the appetizers and then working your way down through desserts is, is, in, is not in much demand these days. People will do a whole cookbook on, you know, picnic food. I, I saw one recently on called Lemons and Limes, and the whole cookbook was just about, you know, just for people who love cooking with lemons and limes or baking with them. And so... There is a trend to become much more specific in cookbooks and choose something packaged in a way. I mean, they might be the same kind of recipes, but they, they're packaged in a very specific way. So you need to understand how that works for your own cookbook. And, you know, if, if you're obsessed with strawberries, would you consider doing an entire strawberry cookbook? Because uh, somebody, p publishers don't want like a book about everything. They want to focus. And if you can't demonstrate that you have expertise in that focus, then you're, you're going to have a problem. That makes sense. So you have to have a good idea, but then you also have to be showing the publisher why you're the right person to kind of execute that idea. Yeah. And I was, I was just, I was in a store recently, which in and of itself is a shocking experience. And, <laughs> and they had cookbooks and I took some pictures of some cookbooks that were super, super niche. Okay. Moon milk, easy recipes for peaceful sleep. That's a whole cookbook. Sunday suppers, go-to recipes for a special weekend meal. Foil pack dinners, 100 delicious quick prep recipes for the grill and oven. Summer, a cookbook, inspired recipes for lazy days and magical nights. Lemons and limes, 75 bright and zesty ways to enjoy cooking with citrus. See where I'm going with this? I mean, would you have thought of any of those, right? Yeah, it's like the exact opposite of the New York Times cookbook that has a thousand recipes in it covering everything on earth. Well, the problem is that the internet has millions of recipes. And so someone still, someone has to fork out, 
you know, maybe $35 for your cookbook. And you do, I mean, when it gets to recipes, you do have to provide recipes that are not easily found online. That's part of what you're offering. And agents, if you want to be traditionally published, agents can tell right away if your recipes are the same old thing or with whether you have a twist on an old favorite or you're top, covering a topic that's not as well known, all kinds of different ways to stand out. If someone does have more of a, you know, they had more of a general cookbook concept in their head and they're listening to you right now, and they're like, okay, I need to narrow this down. What is a way to take a more general concept and find kind of these nuggets of interesting gold in it? Well, you know, whoever thought of the first sheet pan supper cookbook is really knocked it out of the park because that became a big trend. And it's just a question of figuring out what is it that you like to make in, 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 and what are you obsessed with? Like maybe you're obsessed with nuts. Can there be a whole nut cookbook? I, I don't know. You have to do your research, but you also have to be willing to, to be the, that person. Like, the, you know, the person who did the first sheet pan cookbook probably got pretty sick of talking about sheet pan <laughs> suppers after a while. <laughs> And had to come up with, you know, 75 recipes that could be made in the sheet pan. So you have to like the topic enough to really, because you're going to be promoting the topic once you're done with the book. And you should you should have a blog on the topic and a Facebook page on the topic and cooking classes on the topic and, you know, be developing your expertise for it. I run into that all the time. People show up for like uh, dinner parties and stuff like that, or, you know, barbecues and we're like, oh, so, so what's sous vide? And if I can't point out to something that I use sous vide on, like everyone's like, oh, I thought you were going to make something sous vide, you know, they're all, because I, they know me as a sous vide cook. And I'm like, now I, I have to do sous vide for everyone that comes over now. <laughs> oh, great. Well, hopefully you still enjoy that. I do. It's a super convenient way to cook. So it's actually really good for parties and dinner parties, but it's, I definitely, the first time I didn't have any, and I just saw like, they were just so sad. And I was like, oh, oh. no, I've already ruined the party and it's just getting started. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, I mean, you do become that person. I mean, before I became the food writing person, I, you know, I, I've also been the editor of a business magazine and automotive magazine. <laughs> I don't usually tell that to people because they're like, what? I can't, what? I can't even imagine. But yeah, I was, I, I covered court cases and fires and I mean, all kinds of things when I was a reporter, city council meetings. So yeah, you have to be okay with being a version of yourself. Wouldn't you say when you're, you're Mr. Suvi, that is a version of you. It's not all of you, but no one is asking for all of you. They're, they're fine with this. It's kind of like a caricature. I always, the way that I use like as an analogy is if I'm going out to dinner with my wife for like a romantic dinner at a, a nice restaurant in New York City, I dress differently than if I go out with like my improv friends to a bar to grab some beers. One is not more authentically me. One's not, you know, a fake me and a real me. It's just, I'm in different situations with different people. So I dress differently. I might behave slightly differently. I'm a lot, a lot crasser around my improv friends than I am around my, you know, mother-in-law. And that, it's not because one's not me. It's just, I know things are appropriate in some areas. And exactly. I do a podcast. I do my Exploring Sous Vide podcast and this podcast. And in that one, I wear my t-shirt that has the, the pig on it that's in the sous vide machine getting cooked alive. And that's what I wear on that one. This one, I wear a, a button up shirt and try to make sure, you know, I shaved and got my hair a little bit nicer. And it's, it's just, this is more businessy and a little more formal, but still casual and fun. <laughs> you, you didn't really say that the cook, the pig was cooked alive. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I wish I had one it's a uh, cartoon. right nearby. Or it's an illustration. It's a cartoon. Yeah. yeah it's a, it's no, a very happy looking cartoon pig that's sitting in a, a spa, basically, that is a uh -huh. sous vide machine. Thrilled so. to be boiled alive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I, I, wrote, I did write a whole post uh, one time on anthropomorphizing food. It's a way that we, we deal with our ambivalence on the whole subject. 
I can see that my wife constantly says that like she never wanted to go pick up the meat from the CSA that we were a part of because she didn't want to stop believing that it just grows on trees in styrofoam packages. Yeah. Yep. I had a question here from, from Chelsea Cole. She writes a duck's oven. She has a cookbook out on sous vide, another one coming out. And she wanted me to ask you, when you look at all the excellent cookbooks that are out there, what qualities do they share with each other? What kind of embodies a excellent cookbook? Well, for me, I, I want to pick it up and go, wow, this is something I really want to learn about and be so taken in by the title and the, the cover. And I mean, some of it is out of your control as a, as a, as a writer, because the publisher's in charge of the title and the cover and whether you get photographs and how many and whether there are any illustrations and whether it's hardcover and blah, blah, blah. But I want, I want, I, I want to do a deep dive into this person's world and be really knocked out by their enthusiasm and feel like oh, I can't wait to try these recipes. I like cookbooks that are about a place. I'm reading in in Bibi's Kitchen right now, which is about the cooking uh, the cooking of grandmothers in seven countries in Africa, and that's that's a new subject that Ten Speed fortunately was interested in in doing a book with the author about, and and I'm just fascinated by it, and I I and there's a lot in there that's new that I haven't seen before that I want I want to get involved in. I like the voice of the writer, and and they also they also talked about how hard it was to conduct the interviews with these grandmas that they found because they spoke different languages. They had to find translators, and how challenging it was with technology over several continents, and and that was all interesting to me too. So I mean that's just an example of one cookbook that I'm reading right now. But I tend to like the ones that really get into depth on something because otherwise, you know, like I, I bought a turkey breast at Trader Joe's last week and I'm on the internet looking up five recipes for what I can do with it. And I'm not interested in, I just want the recipe. I'm not really interested in, in some kind of deep dive where I'm going to be reading it in bed. I love to read cookbooks in bed. So that's what you're buying these days is, is something that will involve you much more than figuring out how to cook one thing for dinner. I like that. So it's all about expressing your voice and reaching out to the reader and saying, this is a unique take or a unique cuisine, a unique place that they might not have been transported before. And through the book, you can kind of dive more into it, learn about it. And it's not just necessarily providing a recipe for them to cook something. It's providing kind of an entire package that kind of might change the way that they think about cooking. Yes. And, and, you know, there's all kinds of cookbooks. So that's just one kind. And those, those other examples I was giving you, summer, a cookbook, foil pack dinners. I mean, I'd love to, I'd like to look through foil pack dinners because it sounds really easy and Maybe I'd have some new ideas for dinner. And I looked through Moon Milk because I I thought, wow, this is intriguing. I don't I don't know how you could have a whole cookbook on this subject, but she did. So yeah, there's lots of different ways to package your idea to make it appealing to people. You also co-authored two books, Grilled mm -hmm. Pizzas and Piadillas. And so I'm sure I'm saying wrong. <laughs> and the United <laughs> States of pizza. How did that experience differ from working on Will Write for Food? Oh well, it's a completely different thing because Will Write for Food is just narrative, and and the the two cookbooks I was working with a chef. He wanted originally wanted to publish the cookbooks himself, but he just you know he was a chef. He didn't necessarily know how to write a recipe for a home cook or head notes or what the whole publishing process was, how to get an agent and all the other parts of it. So I did, a, I did that part. I, you know, wrote the proposal and found, and we went to my agent and got the contract and the book deal. And then he, I tested all his recipes, which made my husband very happy because I think there were more than 250 pizzas over a few years. And, I think I didn't eat a pizza for 
two or three years after that. <laughs> <laughs> You're just done. <laughs> I'm just kind of done. But but it, it was it was really challenging to. There were certain things that really drove me crazy. For example, the thing that drove me the most nuts was the issue of shredded cheese, because he wasn't the kind of guy where you just, you know, go to the supermarket and buy a package of shredded cheddar. He wanted you to shred Gouda or, you know, all kinds of cheese. So then you'd have to figure out, well, how much food did so, how much cheese do you have to buy to get a half a cup of shredded cheese for the recipe? And then did you, did you assume that somebody already had the cheese or did they have to know how many ounces it was before they shredded it and then how much it was after they shredded it? And I'm telling you, I spent hours on that subject and it drove me absolutely berserk. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't sound like it would be that hard to figure out, but it really was because, because you can buy, the amount of cheese that you buy has no relationship to what it looks like after you shred it. And so it's really hard, you can't, it's really hard to visualize how much shredded cheese you're going to get out of, you know, four ounces of hard cheese. We ran into that a lot with, you know, any, anything that you chop or shred, like if you need a cup of diced carrots, like how many carrots do you need to buy to do that? And we actually ended up developing a website, like a side project called how much is in.com that answers all that. And it gets... <laughs> probably about like 80% as much traffic as my food blog does. Cause so many people are searching for all of these, you know, how much you need a teaspoon of lime zest. How much is in, how much is in.com. Oh man. I'm going to put that in my next newsletter. Cause I think people would really like that. <laughs> We're going through the process of updating all the, the text on it. So it's, it will read a little bit more cleanly in the future. It's one of our projects to, to update it and kind of get it, uh, all, all polished up to, uh, to a little higher standards, but it, it was great for just getting it out there and, you know, how much zest do you need to, you know, how much zest is in a lime? I have no idea. And a lot of people have no idea. So how big is you can the go lime? there and figure it out, you know? Right. Yeah. We did like, here's the average size that from the grocery store. And like, so <laughs> using the average one, if yours is a little bigger or smaller and <laughs> yeah, but you can't get like ultra nerdy about the whole thing, but a lot of the time. It really doesn't matter how much zest is in one line for most recipes, right? And so you can drive yep. yourself insane over these things, but they don't necessarily matter that much. Yeah, I definitely got to the point where people would ask and I'd be like, I don't know and it doesn't matter. Like it's, you might yeah. have a little bit, a little more carroty. Who cares? Like it's right. still going to taste good. It's. <laughs> but you have to figure out, are you going to say one large onion chopped brackets about two cups? Or are you going to say two cups chopped onions and then the reader is going to know how many onions they need or, you know, but whatever you pick, I think the worst part also of writing a cookbook is standardizing the recipes so that every single time that you call for onions, you have to say it the same way, you know, one large onion bracket, about two cups chopped or whatever it is. You have to say it exactly the same way the whole time. And then in the method, you have to say it the same way the whole time. If you're doing the same thing over and over, which we were, we were putting sauce on a pizza and then we were putting the topping on the sauce. So it always had to be said the same way. And so you have to have like a, a cheat sheet of how you say everything so you can say it. Then you get halfway through and you think, no, I don't really like the way I said it. I want to say it a different way. Then you have to go back and change every single one and know where they all are. So yeah, it's a challenge, but it was fun. It was fun and we, we ate very well and Craig and I got along great. We had a few arguments over certain things like, you know, for a pia, a pia dina is two, it's a sandwich basically. It's folded over, it's like a, like a tortilla only you know, a nice a puffy, super soft dough. It's so delicious. And so each recipe made two sandwiches. So he wanted to, he wanted readers to slow roast an entire sheet pan of Roma tomatoes for 
five hours because they would taste good in these two sandwiches. I'm like, uh, no, 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 they're not going to do that. So what do you mean they're not going to do that? It's, it's going to be so good. Well, yeah, it might be good compared to sliced tomatoes, but no one's going to do that for two sandwiches. And then he said, well, why don't we just, then why can't we just make a whole sheet pan of these tomatoes? And I said, well, then what are you going to do with the rest of them? Because the recipe is only supposed to use the amount for the recipe. It's not that kind of a cookbook. If you want to do a cookbook where, you know, the, the chapter is about tomatoes and you roast a whole sheet pan of them at the beginning and then you have five recipes of what you can do with that, that's a different book. So, you know, some of it was an <laughs> education process, but he got it. He got really good at writing recipes and, and he had amazing, amazing flavor combinations and we were very popular with everyone that I knew who came over to eat these pizzas with us. <laughs> people are still, some people are still talking about it. I mean, the, the grilled pizza came out, grilled pizzas and piadinas came out in 2015. And my sister-in-law is coming over for dinner for her birthday on Saturday night. And I asked her what she wanted. She said, I'm still thinking about those grilled pizzas. Do you think, would you be willing to make one? I haven't made one for like six years. So, so it's fun. Highly recommend it. I'm going to have to check out that book for sure. One of the things you're talking about with recipe writing is knowing some of the specifics that go into writing recipes. What is a mistake or two that you see either bloggers or new recipe writers make that should be corrected? <laughs> oh, there are so many. I'm so sorry. But the most basic thing is I have made the same mistake over and over, which is put the ingredients in the order that they're used and then use the ingredients in the order that they're listed. And even though that is a super basic thing, it's very hard to get right. And sometimes people, there's, there's a lot of things. People forget to write head notes. They forget to put in the yield. They put stuff, lots of stuff in notes because they don't want to put it in the head note for some reason. Oh, there's millions, there's millions of things. It's, it's a very technical skill to write a recipe. And a lot of what I end up doing as a coach is is editing recipes, especially in book proposals. And when I've taught classes, the last class I taught, people could send me their recipe at the end and I told them I'd mark it up and send it back. And sometimes I was kind of surprised because some of these people had blogs for a while and there was, was a lot of red. I know I always get a lot of red back uh, on my recipes because I am not as good at that detail oriented. So we've learned after, you know, 15 cookbooks, we've learned that like the first run through is making sure the ingredients are in the order <laughs> listed in the order that they're going in the recipe because Jason is going to mess that up. We make sure that it's, you know, a cup uh, of chopped carrots, not a cup of carrots chopped because Jason's probably going to mess that up. So we kind of know what to look for to fix my mistakes. And it's funny because we know that, that it has to be done that way, and yet we still don't do it that way. Because there's something that you fight against, I think, is going over your copy, you know, over and over and over and making sure that you've got everything. And after a while, it's like you've memorized the whole recipe and you, you can't even tell what sentence you're reading after a while because you've read it so many times. Does that happen to you? Yeah. And your brain starts fixing mistakes that are there instead of noticing the mistakes that are there, which is useless if you're trying to proofread because your brain's just like, no, it, this is fine this way and translates it in the way that it should be. And it's still wrong on the page. Yeah. So there has, there needs to be a lot of eyes on it and a lot of repetition. You have to be, you have to be up for that. 
Well, Diane, I appreciate you so much coming on and sharing your expertise. If people, if my listeners want to get more from you, you have an amazing newsletter that you put out twice a month for food writers. They can subscribe to that at dianej.com slash newsletter. We'll put the link in the show notes as well. Thank they can you. find you on Twitter at Diane J, Instagram at Diane M. Jacob, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash food writing. Thank you so much for coming on, being so gracious and sharing so much of your expertise. Thank you, Jason. It's fun, fun to be interviewed by you. I was just thinking that since you were talking about improv, so I wonder how you can work that into your your cookbooks and your your podcast. It definitely helps me a lot of my interview skills and strangely my my networking skills at conferences and stuff. It's made me a lot more confident. I guess if I figure I can walk on a stage with a stranger and make up a world that we have to share. I can probably talk to someone about what their food blog does. So it's, it's helped give me a little, a lot more self-confidence in those situations. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much to come up, for coming on and thanks to everyone for listening. Um, this has been Bacon Bacon. We're all about helping you serve your fans, grow your income and get the most out of your blog. Until next time, I'm Jason Logston. <laughs> <laughs>